Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this year's AWA plus D symposium design is political. Um, I'm, I'm doing my best Kamala Harris impersonation today. So that's, that's my political contribution. <laughs> uh, I'm Meg Coffey, president of AWA plus D and helping me run today's event are our other AWA plus D board members, Vice President Sona Gavorkian, Parliamentarian Audrey Sato, CFO Tony Lewis, and Secretary Yolanda Lettieri. I'd also like to give a special shout out to our program's co-directors, Sarah Garina and Alejandro Ramirez. Thank you also to all the other directors, chairs, and volunteers who contributed to planning this year's symposium. Uh, today's event is also made possible by the generous support of our annual sponsors, ZGF Architecture, Atomic Irrigation, Louis Polson, Invisible Structures, June Tang Photography, and our event sponsor, IOA Insurance Services. So let's get political. It is my honor and privilege to introduce Los Angeles County Board Supervisor Chair First District, Hilda Solis. Her priorities as supervisor include combating homelessness, environmental justice, healthcare access, criminal justice reform, improving parks and open space, and ensuring arts equity for all, just to name a few of her priorities. Prior to becoming supervisor, she served in Congress representing the 32nd District of California and was Secretary of Labor under President Obama the first Latina appointed to a presidential cabinet. I would also like to take this opportunity to personally thank Supervisor Solis for appointing me to the Los Angeles County Department of Beaches and Harbors Marina Del Rey Design Control Board. I'm really enjoying it and feel like we are making a difference. Uh, we will have a few moments after her presentation for questions, so please put those in the chat. And with that, Welcome, Supervisor Solis. Thank you so much, and uh, congratulations to all the uh, delightful participants that are joining us. And I'm really excited to hear about the tremendous work that you all have been doing for many years and where you go from here, pivoting after the pandemic. Uh, so congratulations to the Association of Women in Architect and Design and on your a virtual symposium that you're hosting today. So really uh, excited about this. I know that you wanted, to, you wanted to know more about me and my personal background and how I got involved in politics and public service. I like to say public service because politics doesn't always capture, I think, the essence of, of what I have dedicated my life to. And, you know, I'm very passionate about that and partly because of my background. Um, I'm a daughter of immigrants. My parents immigrated here from other countries, from Mexico. My father and my mother came from Nicaragua and they met in Los Angeles uh, quite, uh, you know, quite, uh, uh, how could I say, uh, unbeknownst to me in an English class. <laughs> they were settling in uh, here in Los Angeles and they met in an English class, wanting to become so much a part of the fabric of the local community and to be able to learn the language and, and then go on uh, to do more. Uh, their worth ethic was something that was very much a part of, of my upbringing, uh, along with my seven siblings. And I will say that I am the third of seven, so I'm the middle child, and was the first one to uh, be able to access uh, higher education. But it all did not come easy. We didn't even know that we were in a low income category, to be honest. We were on the free lunch program. We had the support of many governmental programs during the time that I was growing up. But I took advantage of that in many ways uh, that I could. Uh, in fact, um, during my high school years, I was engaged in uh, summer, uh, summer youth programs that now at the County of Los Angeles. Were so again, just briefly, uh, you know, a little bit about my background. Grew up in a large uh, Latino family, first one to go to college. It wasn't all roses, though. It wasn't all a bed of roses, to be very frank with you. As, as a student in high school, um, one of my high school counselors actually told me that I should uh, become an office clerk and forget about going to college, that I wasn't qualified and I wasn't college material. But I had another 
a teacher who was actually telling me, you know what, Hilda, you're bright. Um, given your circumstances, you can, you can make it in college and there are programs available to help you. And uh, if you're interested, I wanna, I wanna help you pursue that. And, and uh, he convinced me to think about going to college. And so uh, while the first college counselor at high school said I, I could only amount to maybe a secretary, uh, I can look back now some 50 years and say, well, maybe he was half right. He was half right because I did eventually become in my career trajectory, the first Latina secretary of labor in our US government, proudly representing the San Gabriel Valley and LA County. <laughs> and I know that the story will resonate with many of you because how many times have you been told that you can't go this route or, oh no, you're stepping out of your line. You don't have the resources. Who's gonna mentor you? You don't have all the tools that are necessary. But that didn't keep me from seeking the tools and the mentors and the relationships that are necessary to make somebody successful. And success doesn't come in a minute. It comes over experiences, being able to take those risks. And I truly believe that those of you that are sitting there before me have also made those decisions. In fact, because you have entered into many non-traditional roles. And I, I really want to applaud you. But it also takes other individuals to believe in us, to give us those opportunities. So while I was making my way through college, and then going on and being encouraged by women role models, but also equally male role models and under, underrepresented groups, they were telling me, uh, go on, further your education. And I was able to successfully complete my master's degree at USC, knowing that there were only three minorities in my graduate class. And that was also um, very a very powerful uh, influencing uh, part of my life to, to kind of teach me that, you know what, it's okay, um, just persevere and find those resources outside to help you uh, that can make you a better person. And as a result, I had some wonderful internships. I had some wonderful experiences that helped to make me who I am. I eventually uh, had an opportunity while I was at USC to intern in the White House under the Carter administration. And lo and behold, it wasn't initially a paid internship. So I was literally giving my, devoting my volunteer time, working 50 hours a week, sometimes on Saturdays. But if that is what was going to cut it, I was going to do it. And I was going to learn as much as I could. So there's this old saying that says, be a sponge. I like to use that metaphor. Be a sponge. Take up as much information as you can. And like a sponge, wring out all the bad things. So you have in your career maybe uh, been exposed to things that have been good and bad and some things that maybe aren't different, let those go. Don't let that kind of hover over you and, and hold you down. I think that's really important for women to hear. And as someone who has gotten then involved in politics and running for office, believe me, I was scared to death. I never envisioned myself being the Secretary of Labor, ever running for Congress and taking on an 18 year incumbent, a male Latino. I, I was being told, Hilda, how dare you do that? How dare you challenge our democratic process by thinking that you could fill in and run for Congress. I was told by many people, including friends that I had that I had uh, accumulated over time that said, oh, Hilda, I don't think we can support you for that race. Well, guess what I did? I, knowing me, I, I got a little angry and put my energy to work and started collectively working with other outside groups and building coalitions. And I built a coalition with environmental groups and I want to tell you, one of the most important aspects of all my career in any of my campaigns has been the strong support of women, because we have, as you know, in many ways, um, not achieved the same kind of representation and financial support just to get a campaign going. I'm sure some of you know how that is, making sacrifices to get your education or even starting your own business, getting the capital to do that. I get that. And, I, and it's no different for those of us that are in a, a political office. Um, and I, I can tell you that I don't regret uh, doing any, any of those uh, different steps that I took. The first one was, was a local government at Rio Hondo Community College. I served there for eight years. At the same time, I was also running a state education program to help minority and underserved students go to college because I believe so profoundly that if I could do it, if I could envision seeing myself and 
going through that, that I could easily then share that information, impart that and successfully help other people go on to higher education. And as a result, the program is still in existence uh, long now, and many people have gone through and been successful uh, and found their place uh, in, our, in our society, in academia, in, in professions like yours in engineering and, and architect design uh, and all kinds of great things. So I'm a big advocate for that. Big advocate also for seeing more women being represented on different boards and commissions. That is so important to continue to have uh, more than just 50% of women, but the capacity to have well-trained individuals, women that can bring talent and skills and a different perspective. And certainly we do as women, as policymakers, sometimes we look at a problem and we come up with solutions and we don't look at it in many ways, who gets the credit, but it's how we can come to an agreement and, and, and uh, negotiate and make our, our concerns uh, known and do it in a manner that's respectful and that in some cases can be a learning experience for us. Sometimes um, I think that being in those, in those unique uh, places are very, very important. And now here I am at the County Board of Supervisors after serving uh, in, as cabinet secretary. So I, I served in the political arena, administrative arena, and now I'm back home here in LA County uh, where, I, where I started. And I can tell you that this last year and a half has been tremendous. All of us have gone through so much with the pandemic, COVID-19. We were forced to do things that we had never done before that are unimaginable. And things that we had to do to make sacrifices just to keep our engine, our, um, our wheels turning, whether it was businesses that had to close because of the pandemic or women uh, having to work from home Childcare also being a factor there, as well as uh, impacting uh, our economy and mostly impacting a lot of women. And I see that also now in our recovery where we're gonna have to do a lot more to help provide support and assistance, especially for women that wanna go back to work and feel an obligation that they have to be home because they have children or they're taking care of a spouse or an elderly parent. Um, no doubt this pandemic has really shown where a lot of the, ga the gaps are in our, in our uh, safety net system. And the county plays a big role there. I wanna tell you that I'm very excited though about opportunities that came about because of the pandemic. And because our federal government through the CARES Act money, we were able to retool, regenerate and, and even upstart projects that we could have never gotten off the ground. One of which that I'm very proud of having to deal with homelessness and building in a matter of six months or less with the use of CARES Act money and property that we owned to be able to put up a uh, interim housing unit for 232 units of beds for homeless individuals, people that were both men and women that are living on the streets or recently uh, incarcerated that are out and trying to provide them help with wraparound services. We did this in record time. People uh, originally thought that we were gonna be spending millions and millions of dollars. Well, I wanna say that uh, through the CARES Act money, we were able to use about 43 million dollars side for CARES Act funding and then target an area that actually would have a regional purpose on property that the county owns. So it wasn't though we had to go buy property. We bought this property a long time ago, but it was ours. And so we could expedite the permitting process, CEQA, a whole lot of things that we were able to undertake and work with our Department of Public Works, as well as an outside developer and bring in other individuals that traditionally we would probably not even think of. We brought the cost down for the project, and in lieu of building straight up uh, from brick and mortar, we used, which some of you may be familiar with, are uh, those um, portals that you see uh, out at, at, at the, uh, you know, out, out at uh, Long Beach and, and uh, Los Angeles uh, Harbor, where you see many of those containers, right, shipping containers that have been converted now to houses. And later, to, later uh, on in my presentation, you'll see a purview of what that looks like. And people, you know, I thought at first, this is not acceptable. How are we gonna put people housing them in, in, a, in, such, a, in such a space? But the creativity of the architectural design, which was led by a group of women, by the way, um, helped to put this together. And when we, when we saw it uh, on paper and then actually visited the construction site where they were piecing these units together, I was blown away. And I thought we can, we can do more of these types of housing units quickly without having to uh, wait years, four or five years to see a facility uh, like this uh, be put up. 
and in a space that's beautiful, that involves artists, that involves environmental design, that involves, uh, you know, it also involves remediation because we had to clean up the area that was previously going to be a, a jail, a men's central jail. We used the property, the acreage there to do this. And we're hopeful now to create what we call a restorative care village, to put care first, care first, jails last. And what that means for us at the county is to be able to, to build housing, to build uh, recuperative care beds on sites like LAC USC, which again is a part of the LA County property. So we can expedite the process and be creative about our construction, our environmental awareness, our sustainability, cleanup, and thinking about the community at large and who that embraces and who can be a part of even the uh, contracting opportunities that come about, whether it's minority women-owned veterans, and hiring up local individuals, both men and women, that could fill these construction jobs, but also any other aspect of that project. So as we move forward, we're going to be looking at opportunities like that at the County of Los Angeles. And it's not just in my district, it's going to be countywide and it has been, and it will be. So I'm looking forward to seeing more of you uh, partake in some of the opportunities uh, that I'm engaged in right now. Um, you know, I am so excited about the potential to reimagine properties that we own right now. In fact, there's a property downtown in the Arts District. You may know uh, there in the Arts District, there is a building there that we currently own and occupy, and it's run by the Department of Social Services. It's on Hewitt and, uh, what is it, Hewitt and, and, and Fourth. Uh, we're going to be repurposing that, that area, and we're going to be building affordable housing and low-income housing for artists and also for families. We're also going to have, hopefully, the uh, developer that we enter into agreement there with helping us repurpose and reconfigure that Department of Social Service office. It doesn't have to be a biggest footprint that it has now. It'll be smaller. And we can also create office space and other, other opportunities for other uses that we could provide to the marketplace and hopefully generate funding from that marketplace lease to help provide for the building out of this facility. That's just one example of what we're doing creatively uh, with our resources. Want to also mention to you, some of you may, who are from LA, know about the old uh, Autry Museum down here in, in uh, on, um, by the Chinatown uh, rail, light rail uh, system there, the Loomis, the Loomis home, right? So in that area right now, uh, Autry Museum owns it, but we're looking at acquiring that and repurposing it, keeping it as a traditional uh, museum, but opening it up more to the community and creating potential housing. And it could be housing for seniors or veterans uh, and also creating space so that artists can also come in from different backgrounds, ethnicities to be able to share their artwork with the community and hopefully become uh, a, a tourist attraction again for people and, and be placed so, so close to our transit line, right, our, uh, our gold line station, so that people from all over the county can come and visit. And these are opportunities that I look at that really open up so much more for our community in terms of education, but also thinking about how we do all of these projects environmentally sound, sustainable, and with the community invo involved. So it isn't about gentrification or displacement, but it's creating space that also invites the local community that has traditionally been there and opening up opportunities to do that. I think that's really what's exciting about the job that I have right now in dealing with that. And I'm hopeful that we can use some of our uh, remaining CARES Act money, as well as our new res rescue uh, relief money that should be coming down soon from the federal government to help build out more opportunities to build childcare facilities and we're going to be doing that also on the LAC USC campus. That's going through um, construction right now. And also these recuperative beds that I've been talking about, recovery, uh, restorative care village, so to speak. This will also be a place for people to get well. So while, while they are coming out of maybe um, jail or, or need or, or living on the streets, they can then receive the wraparound services, mental health, the healing that they're going to need, be able to stay in a safe place on our campuses that are also going to be built as portables. So they're low cost. 
They will be um, a series of those being built in the, in the next two years. And I'm excited about having more individuals like yourself come and tour and see these kinds of opportunities. And especially for the young people that are venturing into these new careers to think outside the box and to understand that the uh, advances and, and opportunities for you in this area are endless, in my opinion. And I, I definitely want to be a part of that. I should also mention to you that I serve on the Metro board, uh, you know, one of the largest transportation entities in the country. And uh, I am currently serving as vice chair. In July, I will be taking over as chair. So I, I will have two roles, chair of the board of the County Board of Supervisors and Metro. Oh my goodness, what am I asking for, right? <laughs> I, well, I'm asking for my staff number one and people to help to help and provide good advice, but also participate and understand that um, we are really changing the way that things are happening and being governed right before our eyes. And I hope that all of you will, will take advantage and look at that. The Metro board also gets involved in building things, not just rail systems underground and, and also setting up better uh, pathways for uh, pedestrian, but also buses and also walkways. And really thinking again about how we, how we envision our, our lives so intertwined and the pandemic really forces us to think about that. So many people were, were staying at home. They weren't using our rapid transit system. We went from 1.2 million ridership to 500,000 and we lost a lot of people. A lot of people don't wanna come back on our system because they're not, they don't feel safe or they feel that uh, the system doesn't take them to where they need to go. All of that has to be brought together and we have to figure out how to make it better and to build housing along some of those transit lines so that people don't have to get in their car every single day and get on a freeway just to go to work and be in traffic for two hours. Um, I already see that coming back now and I'm very worried about that because of congestion, pollution, and again, time away from our families and things that we should be really prioritizing. And it, and it hits women the hardest. There was a study done on women and transit use. And believe me, it was very glaring. The data show that women uh, take shorter trips um, on our system and they really don't feel safe. So we need to do more to talk to them. And, it, and it's a, a point of view from all aspects, professional women, as well as uh, grandmothers, uh, parents who are taking care of children, students, young women who are students who have felt assaulted on our rail system and wanting us to deal with these, these issues and be more open about them. So in my chairmanship, I'm, I plan on continuing to look at equity and also looking at how we bring about those concerns that our women riders have, as well as partic participation of our minority women businesses and women-owned businesses, taking part in some of the contracts and, and deliberations that are going to be available in the next coming year as we move towards the Olympics. We have many projects, 2020 projects that we are looking at, 2028 projects that we're looking at, 10 top priorities that are gonna, that are gonna require a, a, new, a new type of uh, human resource. And, and I hope, hope that the folks that I'm speaking to right now will, will have a place uh, and, and think about maybe getting involved in some of the projects that, that we will be undertaking at the Metro Board. Um, those are exciting things. And I'm, I really do wanna say that uh, it's an exciting time for all of us. And I really do wanna continue to support what you all are doing and hopefully invite you to see some of the projects that we're working on. And I am a big proponent of seeing more young people take on internships and people being mentors to these young people um, because I, that's what made me successful. I mean, if you can call it success, I'm not, I'm not boasting. I'm just saying that it helps to have a coach. It helps to have someone guide you through uh, some of the rigors that uh, you're gonna be going through in your career. And as you continue to make your mark uh, on the world, um, it's always good to have people around you that you can trust that can help guide you. And I, I am uh, forever grateful for the opportunity to serve in the capacity as a board of supervisor and want to do so much more. So um, if there are any questions, I do wanna show you a little preview of our video because I know uh, we, we lost some time as we were trying to get back <laughs> on our Wi-Fi, but, um, and then take any questions, but I definitely wanna uh, encourage you to, to get involved uh, and to know that um, the sky's the limit for you and especially for women of color. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that there's, there's always opportunity 
and chance for us to, to think outside and to look for other resources and to build coalitions. Sometimes you're not gonna find, uh, you know, that even in amongst our own small little groups, that sometimes you have to venture outside of that group to get even more information and advice and, and taking risks. And I know everyone says, well, risks can have consequences. Make calculated risks, you know, understand, weigh those and talk to people and then get to the decision that you think you, you've made. And sometimes we make mistakes, but it's okay. Pick yourself up. Um, I've had to do it throughout my career and I'm not gonna look back, I'm gonna look forward, but I'm also wanting to help impart information so people don't make the same mistakes that I did and, and hopefully can continue to be successful uh, in, in their careers. And especially all of you, and I'm so proud uh, that so many of you went to Cal Poly Pomona, alumnus from Cal Poly and also USC. Uh, I have to boast also UCLA because I have three sisters that remind me <laughs> They all graduated from UCLA, two are engineers and one was a PhD. So that just tells you the tenacity of women is there and especially in our own, in our own family. So thank you so much, uh, Meg. And if it's, if it's appropriate, if we could just see that little video, that would be great. And then I'll take any questions. That's very inspiring. Thank you so much, Supervisor Solis. Um, we are over time, but I'd like to get in just a couple of questions because we have you here and we want to take full advantage of your of, of you being here. Um, we had uh, one question about what you consider to be the most important or where you might suggest uh, places where we could devote our energies uh, for our volunteer efforts and also our financial support. Wow. Um, I could think of a lot. <laughs> um, whether it's building things or helping lives, there's two categories. Uh, one that ha recently has driven me is really helping the homeless and helping women. And, and uh, the Downtown Women's Center has, does an excellent job. They need mentors. They have a store there. Um, they're teaching women new skills that haven't been employed for years or women that have been on the street. And many of them represent our communities. That's a place that may be focusing and giving time to that. Um, if maybe you wanna come and volunteer eventually at our uh, you know, Hilda Solis Care Village, that could be an opportunity to see what that's about. And I would love if you're interested, a group of you to set up a tour with my staff so you can go visit the actual facility and see what I see and see the inside of where these people live. It mentioned there's a dog park there. We need, we need to be able to have volunteers to help us with folks there. Uh, and so many exciting things that are going on. Um, as of late, this is a little bit off, but not really because it's about helping empower people. We, we opened up uh, an intake center at Pomona Fairplex. There are right now 400 unaccompanied minors. Guess what? They need role models, especially if, even if you don't speak Spanish or whatever, it doesn't matter. These kids are thirsty. 
they're dying to to know what it what it's like to be here what opportunities are here and there are a lot of young girls even being able to read to them to talk to them or even making donations available clothing shoes books uh, uh ipads things of that nature um, can go a long way for many of these young accompanied, unaccompanied minors that are here, but will be settled with families and people. And some will be looking for guardianship and foster, foster homes. So there's a whole lot of different things that can be done. Um, but I do want to continue to say to you that um, we need more of you represented in terms of doing business with the county. So partnering with us in terms of being on our contract list and also with the Metro. Um, because those are endless opportunities. And they, there's also opportunity for people to intern in the county as well as with Metro. So those are good places to start. Great. And we will, um, we, there were quite a few uh, comments in the chat that we would love to tour your, your village. So we'll, um, we'll contact your people to set that up. Thank you. Thank you um, so much. Thank you so much for your time. And we know that you're a busy lady and, and, you're obviously a very busy lady. And so we thank you so much for the time um, that you gave us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And again, I apologize for the hiccup, but have a good conference. Yeah, go. thank you so much. Go, go women, go women. Awesome. Go, hey, go team. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Supervisor Solis. Uh, we were so inspired to see this presentation. Um, I um, am uh, now going to, we're now going to switch to our next section um, uh, of today's programming. I am Sona Givorkin, uh, the Vice President of AWA Plus D, um, and I am here to uh, introduce the panel uh, discussion that's coming next titled Politics in Action. Uh, most of the panel members today have um, design backgrounds, but also have uh, also hold positions which allow for political influence. Um, Joining us today are Renee Dake Wilson, uh, our moderator, and uh, she's also the principal of Dake Wilson Architects. Um, Emily Gable Luddy, instructor at UCLA Extension Program in Landscape Architecture. Um, Stephanie Landrigan, uh, director of Landscape Architecture Program and the Horticulture and Gardening Program at UCLA Extension. Um, Karen Mack, exec executive director at LA Commons. Uh, and Deborah Weintraub, uh, Chief Deputy Engineer, uh, City Engineer at Bureau of Engineering at the Department of Public Works. And now um, I will hand it over to our moderator, Renee Dake Wilson. Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad to see you. And I'm so glad to have this opportunity to talk with these uh, four women that I consider mentors. And I hope that we can all learn from them about ways that we can uh, get more involved in our communities and make a difference. That's certainly why I chose to be involved in, have chosen to be involved in government. Not only is it interesting, but it's a way to make change. What I found was interesting in the introductions um, just now was that four of us are, um, have jobs that are not in government and that our government role is outside of our, uh, of our job job. And um, I, I think that's one way to get involved. So I think that we can, I hope that we can get a wide variety of uh, descriptions about how other people can choose this path to making a difference. So um, each of the speakers is going to introduce themselves uh, more, uh, more from their own perspective about how they label themselves and see their identity as we were talking about earlier. And um, I want them to talk about how they got their voice, their values and their vision. Um, how did they get to where they are? Um, and how did you become interested in having a role in government? First, I'd like to start with Emily Gable Luddy, who's now uh, calling herself a professor, but I know her from her previous job. Thank you so much, Renee, and it is absolutely a pleasure to join these amazing women this morning on the panel, but also to see you all. Uh, I thought that Hilda Solis said some very important things, and one thing she, one phrase she used was that she looks at it as public service, 
not as being a bureaucrat or something like that. And I think that's a very important distinction because I spent most of my professional career in public service. Uh, so how did I get shaped by this? You know, I've been thinking about this in terms of forks in the road throughout my career. And I wanted to share with you that I was raised in East Los Angeles in El Sereno. I recently found out three months ago that the uh, neighborhood that I lived in was a red line neighborhood. And it gave me some more insight into um, my family and the neighbors that we had and how we all grew up because we're kids. We don't notice the poverty. We don't notice the color of our neighbors. We just enjoy playing where we're playing and seeing our friends and it is if you think back to when you were a child, you don't even see any of that. And, and where we are today, it's almost like calling back to those days and bringing those days forward into your work to have more uh, effect. The other thing I'll say about growing up in El Sereno is that my mother was an adult, part-time adult education teacher and she taught English as a second language. She taught at Roosevelt. She taught at the Mead Housing Projects. She taught at Lincoln High School. Um, and so we were pretty much, we shopped at Sears. You know, we went down Soto Street. We're pretty much part of, of an East Side uh, education and upbringing. But when, when I went to, to landscape architecture school and I lived for four years in New England and two years in Japan, I want to tell you that those six years were all forks in the road for me because the ability to travel with a backpack in a youth hostel, but to see all kinds of different cultural traditions was a, it played a big uh, influence in my life as I matured. I went to work for the city of Los Angeles for two reasons. Number one, I was hired as an affirmative action hire under the program in the 1970s called the CETA program. And because I had an offer from a private sector landscape firm and the city of LA, and I went to work for government because I knew I would get equal pay. I knew that the bosses that I had would not pass over me for a young man that came in to work in the office. And my experience in working in the private sector for a year was just that. So I made a very calculated decision to work for the public sector. And in doing that work, um, I like, and I wanna hear Stephanie talk about this and all of you, as I uh, worked, first I worked for the parks department. Yes, there are parks designed by me still in Los Angeles. Um, I, I lost my job, so I was able to transfer to the planning department. And, and part of what shaped me was with a design background, with the skills of drawing and seeing and uh, evaluating, it gave me a great, I think better insight into um, looking at cities as a big landscape. I mean, if you think about Los Angeles, it really is. It's the hills, it's the river. And if you kind of squint and scrape away all the development, you can return LA to its essentialness, which is a chaparral, semi-arid environment. And one of my crusades since I've been um, out of public office for a while is to restore nature to the city. This was always an objective of mine when I worked in city planning, to repopulate our front lawns with plant materials that attract bees and butterflies and move us back into where we were before in a profound way that's respectful of the environment. Um, so I just say I come from a tradition of public education. I, I went to Occidental College. I graduated from the University of Massachusetts. Uh, I received a fellowship to Harvard University when I was a mid-career professional, which was another fork on the road for me. When I left City Hall in LA, I ran for public office, which was another fork on the road, got elected and served for 10 years on the Burbank City Council. Now I will stop there 
I will say a driving force behind that service was to keep nature in the city, not to cut down those trees, to make sure that every development that was planned in Burbank was a value added development that helped build the neighborhood and not just build the building in the four corners of the property lines. So I, I will stop there. Uh, thank you so much, Renee, for your initial question and um, look forward to having further conversation. Thank you, Emily. What about you, Stephanie? You're alphabetically next. What about your voice and your values and your vision? Well, thank you very much, Emily. That was fascinating. I've known Emily a while and I've learned quite a bit about her today. <laughs> and uh, thank you all. Thank you, AWA Plastique for inviting me. And also it's lovely to see everybody here. Um, I'm a licensed landscape architect, and it's something I say proudly because whenever I do go and present myself in political arenas, I always say that because um, I am a, an activist. I've always been an activist for the environment, for open space, and for design. And I think that how did I get there is the question. Well, um, unlike Emily, I'm not, I'm not from Los Angeles. I'm actually from Texas. And uh, so don't hold it against me, please. Uh, and our family used to go to Mexico as missionaries on our vacations. So all my vacations are now service oriented because it was effective for me to see. Um, and we, we worked with the Otomi Indians um, and that is their Indian communities that were outside of Mexico City. We worked with the uh, uh, FMC, which was the Familia, uh, it's the Catholic organization, and we would bring materials down. This is many years ago. I mean, I'm not going to tell you how many, but it was very instrumental in me understanding that service is part of your life. And so um, what I did is I, I, I became more of an activist. I sort of didn't keep this in mind as I grew up through college and went on to other areas. But when I was in New Mexico, I moved to New Mexico. Um, I bought a piece of property that had uh, flooding irrigation as part of its heritage. And they were going to take that right away. And I had a very small uh, neighborhood and I gathered all our neighborhood together. And we fought this. Now, I know this isn't environmentally sound, but it wasn't right. And there was no way you can you can water a third of an acre and and survive in New Mexico unless you have these rights. So we fought and we got the water irrigation agency to put in a pump and a pond for us to use to water our neighborhood to keep our heritage rights. Now this empowered me. This is the first time I realized that I had power and that our politicians would listen to me. And this is what I think is the most ennobling element of us as designers and us as people is that we can affect legislation. We can affect it so it doesn't badly affect us. And if you don't get involved at the beginning, you're going to be a victim of what you didn't say at the very beginning. And that's an important piece of information to remember. And so I want to say as an end here, I now run a landscape architecture uh, education facility and a horticulture. And I believe these are really important elements to uh, help create other individuals who will be activists. Just yesterday or the day before I sent out a missive to every one of my instructors and every one of my students to please do an act of advocacy which is to write about a piece of federal legislation that is proprietary against landscape architects. Now, I am happy to share my professional opportunities with everyone, but I am very actively involved in stopping somebody from limiting professional activities. And so I'm hoping that we had close to 75 answers to that because it's a very important element. So advocacy is taking care of things at the moment. And 
I believe that my purpose in life is to re-sanctify the earth. I think that's what landscape architects do, is we take places that may have been defiled, especially as a park planner. And as, as uh, the supervisor just showed us, she took an area and she re-sanctified it. She gave it purpose. She gave it a, you know, a place that's holy, shall we say that word. So that is what I think I do. And I think Los Angeles is a sacred place. And my purpose right now is to make sure that all my students and that all the work I do contributes to that re-sanctification of, of Los Angeles. And then I would like to just say um, one last thing. Parts are political. They're very political and education is political. And the more that we make sure that we're dealing equitably and inclusively, I believe that we are going to make the world a better place. And I think advocacy is the way to do it. Martin Luther King Jr. said, it is always the right time to do the right thing. Beautifully said, very poetic. But you have a commissioned role also right now, Stephanie, don't you? Yes, I've, I've had many, I'm very politically involved with uh, um, being appointed, because I think that when you're appointed, you're able to really affect the legislation. And I am on the state mining and geology board in the landscape architecture role. And um, it's um, not, it's a little known, but pretty important commission, which affects land use and, and, uh, and reclamation of land uses that oftentimes can be very destructive to the landscape. Previous to that, I was appointed by four speakers of the um, assembly to uh, the Landscape Architects Technical Committee. And uh, I work very closely with whomever is running for office that I really like their politics. And I work with them, I volunteer with them, I give them money. And I think that's essential for us to be visible is to be involved in supporting those who are going to support good design and our professions. Thanks, Great. Renee. What? Thank you. Oh yeah. Thank you for sharing. You know, that's another way. See, that's another way to be involved in politics. What about you, Karen Mack? I've lost you on my screen. Oh, there you are with your mural. Hi, everyone. Uh, such a pleasure to be here with this uh, august group um, of uh, designers by training. I'm not one, but I'll tell you more about that um, in a minute. Um, but I wasn't going to say this, but I was inspired by my um, by everyone to just start with my early life. And um, one of the most seminal experiences for me was being a lifeguard. Um, I was a lifeguard in county parks, and I got there kind of through that program that uh, Supervisor Solis talked about. There was a robust uh, summer hiring program with the county, and I ended up, you know, working my way up to being, you know, the lifeguard. Never, never one to settle for being told what to do. Um, and so um, I was a lifeguard at a pool in Watts for many years, and I actually grew up in Compton. And... Um, you know, that was, I think, my first real, because my parents sent me out of Compton for school, but like the real experience with, you know, seeing inequity, like very close up. And it really had a profound impact on me because I've always um, recognized from that age, uh, you know, the immense potential of young people. And so, um, you know, just to see the light go out of their eyes was was really, I mean, that that was my um, uh, inspiration, I think, to be an activist. And um, so about 20 years ago, I started LA Commons, the organization that I continue to run. And my vision at that time was really for a connected city, recognizing that um, the bonds of trust between people are really our most important resource um, in creating a functional place. Um, 
what was distinctive about what I was doing was that I really focused on using art and culture as the tool to create those connections. Um, and uh, since that time, we've worked throughout the city uh, using local stories as the basis for public art and other community engaged initiatives like festivals, tours that um, bring people together to make their places better. Um, I feel very lucky because every day I get to engage in work that really is about my values and vision. And, um, uh, you know, as a matter of fact, that's really why, how I started this journey. Um, I um, uh, have, I, um, uh, you know, was tired at that point of working for somebody else um, working to implement someone else's vision. And so I decided, you know, I really wanted to be myself in the world. And so, um, you know, this idea of voice really came from taking this very scary step. I was at the time vice president of Community Partners, which is a organization that supports nonprofits, um, you know, startup initiatives. And, um, you know, I was like, you know, I don't want to be a consultant. I really want to uh, do the work that I feel is going to have an impact on Los Angeles. And so, um, uh, you know, that that taking that step, having the courage, and I think that is so much of, of what it takes to really live your values and visions is to have the courage to step out of, you know, the box and, you know, create your own life. Um, and so I, um, you know, this, this step has put me in the position of being able to influence the built environment. I don't have a degree in architecture or planning. My degree is, my, I have an MPA um, and uh, MBA and my undergraduate degree is in accounting actually. Um, but you know, through my work at LA Commons, I've really been a student of the, um, the, the ways that the built environment furthers a sense of community. And uh, I'm part of a national initiative called Creative Placemaking from the Community Up. And that really is the point of view that I bring to everything that I do. Um, really uh, recognizing the primacy of the community's voice in creating places that reflect their wise vision and uh, their uh, real ability to further health opportunity and happiness for all. And, you know, I, I, I think that that was, that is why I was appointed to the planning commission is this connection between uh, really uh, engaging people and uh, work that did that does have an influence on the built environment that does foster uh, creative place making um, and uh, and and you know it's it's unfortunate. I mean, I, how do I say this? My point of view is uh, is uh, 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 a little radical. I think in that environment, but that I think it's good because at this moment when we're having this conversation about equity, uh, to have someone who comes from my perspective is very important because I don't believe you get to equity in, unless you have community involved in the conversation. And I'll stop there. That's beautiful. I've uh, so enjoyed serving on the planning commission with Karen and she brings such a great voice um, to that role. Um, another person in our LA city environment is Deborah Weintraub. Um, can you talk about your voice values and vision and vision and how you got to be the architect at the engineer's office? Thank you. Um, it is great to be here and to listen to everyone's stories. I really do appreciate it. Um, my, my role at the city, I, I, I'm called the chief deputy city engineer. So that means I'm number two in our department, but I've never had an engineering degree. I'm an architect. 
I'm the first architect to be in management there. I'm the first woman to be in management there. And I really do credit my boss, the city engineer, for, for saying, you know, God damn it, we're going to make sure this environment's diverse. And engineers tend to be men. They tend to be, uh, they have tended in the past to be white. So a little bit about my background, though, because it's interesting how people's journeys take them to where they are. My father coming out of World War II, took advantage of the GI Bill and got a degree in journalism and then applied to be a diplomat. So I'm the daughter of a diplomat. And I grew up traveling the world uh, thinking everyone did this. You know, I get stuffed into the back seat of a car, driven into Cambodia to see Angkor Wat. I just thought everyone did this. And I was, as a kid, very dreamy. You know, I spent my childhood, my parents thought, I'd never amount to anything. I never read a book. I couldn't spell for the life of me. I just sat in the back seat and looked out the window and the world was amazing. And every culture that we traveled through had different physical manifestations of community and of art and of aesthetics. And at the point that I was choosing a career, I, I, I said to my parents, I really wanna be a painter. And my father and mother said, oh my God, no, you know, lawyer lawyer, doctor, whatever. <laughs> they said, at least become an architect. They thought that was a profession. Little did they know how poorly paid and how really poorly respected architects are. So um, I've had a pretty varied career, you know, apprenticed in New York with a number of different firms, um, was often the only woman, woman in the room, um, had my own firm in New York and did a lot of um, house additions, law for innovations, that kind of work. But I found New York to be a very uh, closed society in the design world, very male led, um, uh, very cliquish. And so when, when I had the opportunity with my husband to move to LA, I thought this was a good opportunity because LA as a city tends to accept people making, making themselves here. And it has been that for me. Um, when I first came out, I worked for different architecture firms here. Um, then the economy fell apart and there was no work for architects. So there was a job at the Canadian consulate representing Canada's interests in the five Western states focused on building. And I remember I called my dad up and said, what are they gonna ask me dad? Because it was the Canadian foreign service. And he said, they're gonna ask you about softwood lumber and what the policy is between the US. And so I walked into the interview and they said, so tell us what you know about softwood lumber. And I just practically fell on the floor. Thanks to dad, I knew what to say. Um, and I got hired. Um, eventually though, um, I worked, I, I, I've been an advocate for sustainability for 30 plus years, uh, watching female friends of mine get breast cancer early just seeing some of the impacts of um, a lack of awareness of the environmental degradation and the impact it was having. Um, and so I ran an environmental design charrette for the city of Santa Monica. It was one of the first they did. We brought a Canadian team in. I used my connections in Canada and they wrote um, city design guidelines, which preceded LEED um, and was kind of a seminal um, acknowledgement that, that we as public sector, uh, that pu the public sector could take the lead in this. And from that, I got recruited to Southern California Edison. So I came out of college, a painter and a dancer. I studied modern dance for many years. And there I am working at Southern California Edison. And you, it, you could have, you know, if you had told me I would end up at an electric utility, uh, but I loved it. It was, a, it was a change. It was a time when the utility industry was attempting to go through a change. And I worked in a small group, mostly engineers, who were doing demonstration energy efficiency, sustainability work. And we did some great projects uh, there. From there, I was recruited to the city. I've been at the city 20 years now. It's sort of flown by. Um, I remember when I interviewed for the city, it was older white gentlemen and uh, engineers, you know, they, they didn't have pocket protectors in their front pocket, but they almost did. Um, and I was just an anomaly. And I remember them asking me, so Dara, how many people have you supervised? Because I was coming into a division where I'd su I would supervise 60 to 80 people. So I said, well, about six at most ever. <laughs> so they took a big leap of faith with me and it was very hard. 
that first couple of years, I was coming in from the outside. City employees were not terribly receptive. I was a woman, you know. Um, but I, there was a, a gentleman there who had been there for many years, and I reached out to him. I knew him um, professionally and said, why should I come to the city? Tell me why I should come. And this relates to what you said, Emily. He was very uh, uh, accurate when he said, we're a really diverse workforce. You know, because of the rules, there's a level of, there's a more leveling of the playing field and you won't find that anywhere else. And he was right. You know, the private sector, I just never saw that. And that's, the city has been great that way. Um, and it's always about the next project. And, and uh, you know, we, we're an organization of about 800 people, but we have an in-house architecture division of 60 to 80 people. So it's a pretty big um, in-house staff. We, we collaborate with a lot of consultants. Uh, so we work with the best you know, consultants in LA. Uh, for the last three years, we've been doing homeless facilities. We've built over 2,000 beds um, for uh, the homeless transitional house. Not, it's not transitional, it's temporary housing that we're working on. It's a little different than what the supervisor's project is. Um, so my vision or my voice values and vision is I, I always advocate for the value of design. If we're going to make the investment, when we walk away, it's going to be there for 30 years. It's got to do something to improve that little corner of the city, no matter how big or small the investment is. And the advantage of being in this huge department of engineering is I've had the opportunity to weigh in on streets, on retaining walls, on bridges, on buildings, on parks. Um, lately, 20 years in, and I've been with my boss now for many years, you know, he jokes that uh, I've never lacked an opinion, you know, so I've gotten more outspoken <laughs> rather than less outspoken. I think it's a great, I think being in the public sector as an employee is an enormous opportunity for women and young designers. You really do. I was always frustrated as an architect that I couldn't be at the table when the budgets were set and the site was chosen and the program was written. So I moved more and more towards management because I wanted to help make those early decisions that really help determine a project. Um, and, and I will also say, I, I do give a lot of credit to my boss, Gary Lee Moore. Uh, he has supported women and people of diverse backgrounds in coming into the Bureau of Engineering. And he gave, he's given me enormous opportunities um, that, um, and he, and you know, he, he knows I'll have an opinion and, and sometimes he'll listen to it and say, that's nice, Deborah, go the other way. But, and I'm the only architect in management. So I'm often the only one like recently when we were doing these homeless facilities, we laid them out, we engineered them and then we put them out. So Michael Lair did the first two for us and he came in, did some site adjustment, but he did a fabulous coloration of the facilities and you've probably all seen them published. Um, Cause he's very, he's very skilled with that and thinking about how to make you see the spaces differently uh, with color. And I, I sat through many conversations where we were being lambasted in the press for the cost of these. So everyone was saying, cut the color, cut the color. So I had to fight for the color probably 10 times and 10 different, finally the first one got finished and that's all anyone talks about is the color. They don't care that we created community spaces and a dog park and a showers and a restrooms and, you know. So it's important as designers that we are in the room from the very beginning saying, we got to do this right. We got to think about community. We got to think about how this is going to be used for 30 years. Uh, it can't just meet the codes. It's always got to do more. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it back. I love it. I love hearing everybody's um, nascent stories because we all have them. There are all opportunities that we're providing either as mentors or as people starting out where you're taking an opportunity from being a lifeguard, which I was too, Karen, <laughs> to uh, to uh, being able to hire someone and being a, being able to lift up other voices. I wonder how, if, if each of you or some of you, of the four of you, could talk about one way in which you've been most impactful. It might have been a project you've worked on in a way that was transformative to you and how you see yourself. It might be something that was transformative in the community 
or it might have been transformative in your workplace, what is something that at least a couple of you wanna say about how you have made one big impact? I, I'd like to answer that, Renee, because um, Deborah, re you reminded me of this uh, when you were talking about the engineers and the Bureau of Engineering. So one of the most impactful projects I worked on was setting up the urban design studio in the city planning department. And uh, so I got to choose someone to work with me and then we wrote out our budget and we went to the planning director and said, ha, huh, we need this equipment, we need these staff for positions for support. And she looked at us and said, you're not getting any of that, right? <laughs> we went, huh, okay, so we got the equipment, we, got, we, we went out and recruited student interns who were at SC and Irvine and Berkeley and Harvard to come in and, and Cal State Northridge to come in and fill the gap of skills that we were unable to secure through our own bureaucracy. So I like to say this transformed me a bit into the gorilla that we are very proud of today. Um, the, the one project that I am the most proud of and I think has been the most transformative was redoing all the downtown streets in downtown Los Angeles in a manner that did not permit any more street widenings, in a manner that required the new buildings to respect a series of design guidelines. And we worked with a landscape architect, Pat Smith was our consultant. But the magic of this was meeting every week with the deputy city engineer from the bureau, that was Clark, meeting with the senior transportation planner of transportation, that was old Al Rifkin, meeting with the redevelopment agency senior planners and ourselves. And we went through in real time, all of us together in front of a computer, all of the applications that had been filed to build new buildings in downtown LA through the subdivision process. And we developed the four of us from four different departments with four different points of view, developed the most, uh, I think the most rewarding and profound team of individuals. Because each one who participated and Clark was definitely the senior, I think at the time he was probably in his late sixties, maybe early seventies. Everybody was open to improving the environment around downtown Los Angeles. So as a result, uh, we populated Navigate LA with all the new street standards and developers could go in and see what the requirements were. We populated Navigate LA with all the design guidelines so the architects could see what was expected in terms of the first 30 feet and how it was treated. Um, and the council adopted this unanimously and the central city chamber loved it and the neighborhood council loved it. And so I would say at the end of the day, with that kind of gentle persistence, we found great people to work with within the bureaucracy. And maybe that was finally the thing that was most, most rewarding was looking for those, whether you're volunteering your time or you're doing it as part of a project who are most engaged in this opportunity to see that uh, the sum of the whole is greater than the parts. And that's probably the most impactful project I'd like to share with you. It's deeply rewarding and it's still out there today. Well, I can be very quick. Um, I consider my, uh, myself sort of a guerrilla activist. And one of the things I do is if I hear about a bill that's bad being proposed, I try to intervene. And one of the things you need to remember, this is sort of a lessons learned that I'm sharing and I'm pleased I did this. Uh, landscape architects did not used to be included in the ability to seek a mechanics lien. Now, if you're an architect, you're like, what? Really? So there was, an effort about 15 years ago to change the mechanic liens law. And I heard this and I, now here, 
if you open up a law, it's like open surgery, okay? It's sort of like open heart surgery. And the way you affect laws quickly is you become the virus. So you, I went in and I helped get our nascent little landscape architecture groups all over the state together. And we lobbied and got landscape architects added to the mechanics lean law. This is my greatest success so far. And I have to tell you, you need to remember that if you're paying attention, you can make changes. And this is not a change that affects anyone else. It affected our profession and we had not been politically aware when it first started and we're much more politically aware. So I'm very pleased with that. And um, I look for opportunities like that all the time. Karen. So um, I'm not sure how much time we have left, but um, I we're uh, um, sorry, Karen, we're going to go till 11 o'clock, Meg told oh. me. So oh, okay. we're going to extend our time, but I'm kind of going to remove the third question that we talked about. And we're just oh. going to do about how you work best. So talk about how you've been most impactful because i know you have something good to offer about this oh okay well um so um i thought i would talk about what we're working on right now which which um you know is interesting in the impact it's had so far but i think it has uh, the potential to have a huge impact if we can pull it off um and i think in some ways it answers three of the questions you gave us um so when the pandemic hit um, we were about to celebrate our 20th anniversary and we were going to do like a big event in City Hall, have an exhibition of our work uh, there at the Bridge Gallery and then, you know, everything shut down and we were just like, well, what are we going to do um, to, you know, how can we transform this energy into something that's helpful and we came up with a project called Creating Our Next LA and, you know, as is the culture of our organization, which is kind of the culture that I brought, you know, just kind of being willing to start something without knowing how it's going to finish. Um, we just, you know, said, oh, this sounds like a great idea. And then just started walking down the road to making this happen. And, you know, we were uh, playing around with the idea for the better part of um, last year and you know our work is very story based so we always go into neighborhoods when we do a project work with artists a team of youth take community stories and transform them into works of public art and um and so we you know we had a lot of projects that were collecting stories already so we just transformed them into these conversations about what the challenges of covid were uh, and how you envisioned uh, coming out of it and what you wanted to see in Los Angeles. And I think our real impetus is really artists and youth kind of being the inspiration because they are super imaginers. And I put architects and you know all creators in that category to inspire community members to really imagine. That's what we need so much now is this imagination to um, to get us to the next point, it will be a tragedy if we end up where we have where we have been and where we are after this pandemic is over. We really need to advance. So, so in twenty this year, we got the opportunity to be part of this project called We Rise, which is amazingly funded by the Department of Mental Health. It's a citywide series of installations that are um, about resilience and hope, which is very much aligned with creating our next LA. So we just finished these incredible uh, artworks that came out of gathering community stories, a team of artists coming together to translate those community stories, in, including a poet, um, and uh, and then resulting in these amazing works of art. And one of which I put behind me today, if you can sort of see it. And I thought I would read a poem that came out of it just to, you know, kind of add a, a little interest to the whole idea and give you a sense of what the possibilities are. 
um, let's see if I can find that. So COVID-19 coming near as mom nurses those in fear, like I need to be stronger, but depression gets longer. Motivation disappears. 11th grader fighting anxiety, the color of art, the art of planting a tree, playing a piano, all set me free. Then I am again in La Luna, a reflection of the sun's light. Um, so um, that, uh, I'm trying to get back to you. That um, is just one example. We have eight pieces and the real possibility is to have those stories happening all over Los Angeles that then feed into this incredible transformation that we have next year with a mayor, a controller, city attorney, city council, supervisors all you know, changing. So we need Los Angeles to bring those stories to the process so we can create a platform that will influence uh, you know, that process going forward so we can get the city we want out of this time. So, well, <laughs> all right. We all want to live in that place and we can all go see We Rise around Los Angeles. I went this last weekend on Mother's Day and took some of that uh, art in with my family. Um, so, Deborah Weintraub, I wonder if you could transition us into the last question we were going to talk about, which Karen certainly um, encompassed them all with her answer, which is what do you see as the most important work for you to do in the year ahead? Um, we're going, we are going through a big transition, not only with COVID, with the impacts of climate change, with the impacts of inequity, all coming to a head where our work is cut out for us. And, and what do you see is your coming uh, work to be done most emergently? Well, I love what Karen said about the fact that we have an opportunity to make changes out of this year plus um, shutdown. And I, I, I see it in my own organization, uh, the necessity to move people outside really broke through this whole hesitation about sidewalk dining and outdoor dining in a way that had been hard to break through for a long time. Um, I think going forward, and this is what I would say to young women, is if you're trained in the design field, please get involved. I, I, I'm all for people getting paid. I love the guerrilla activity, but you know, I love being on the inside, like Emily described, working with Clark Robbins. Clark Robbins was a classic. I mean, you were never supposed to smoke indoors. He always did, right? And he, he had, he had been around forever, but really loved the city in a in a in a deep way. Come into the inside, be there. I mean, one of my, I don't think it's a guerrilla activity. It's more an educational activity. It's every time someone presented an amazing design proposal to me, I would plaster our executive conference room with those images, so that instead of just the master schedules, which were you know bar charts of when you were going to finish a project, there were images of the potential changes in the city on the wall so that my colleagues, um, my engineering colleagues would look at them and talk about them. And they're, they're often very reluctant to have opinions. They feel like engineering is fact-based and design is subjective. Um, so having been in the room to have those discussions and say, maybe it's subjective, but there are ways you can measure the uh, positive aspects of certain decisions over others in design. Um, I know Stephanie's worked in that arena also for a long time. I just urge, I urge women designers to uh, find a way to be at the table when these early decisions are being made. And that's what I'm gonna be focused on for the coming years. I really miss being in the office. I think it's very hard to do a design discussion over you know, Zoom or Miro or whatever, I've tried them all. I find it very hard to really talk through options uh, for an approach to a project. But um, that's for the coming year, I hope to be back in the studio, inviting um, outside critics, looking at how the money gets spent and uh, continuing to um, give voices to communities. We, all of our projects we do community outreach on, and I'm always learning what's the best way to do it. Um, 
I recently completed a master plan for the Silver Lake Reservoir, which was a community that had a lot of very powerful and opposing voices. So we, we spent hours talking about how to structure the community input so everyone would feel they had a, a way to weigh in and they wouldn't be drowned out and we could hear all the voices. And so that's, I hope to be back in the office working with people in person again in the coming year. What about you, Emily? What do you see in your future? Well, I'm constantly evolving. So uh, fly fishing is uh, something I took up about three years ago and I'm pretty good at it. And I wanna tell you this, fish don't live in ugly places. So it affords an opportunity to go to Yosemite, to Mammoth, to Hot Springs, to the Owens River. And I say in all heartfelt expression, it's good to rest your eyes from the professional advocacy that you commit yourself to. Because what happens in doing that, you'll find that subconsciously you're integrating all the ideas that you had or what you heard or what the pushback was. And when you re-arrive at your point of professional activity, you'll find an answer just presenting itself. I have a great faith in the process of life itself um, because it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, I, I'm, I'm volunteering my time right now. I, uh, I read bad bills out of Sacramento and ask pr practical questions. Uh, uh, and I am teaching, if Stephanie will have me back in the winter at UCLA, um, because one of the things I am learning is um, climate change, unsheltered, lack of art and sensibility, all need to be integrated into our design thinking moving forward. And maybe that's more important than ever. So that's what I look forward to doing. That's great. Stephanie, you got a light one there. Wow. Um, what to tee up with that last sentence from Emily. Yeah, it is hard to tee up with that. Well, I just recently finished teaching an internship for LAUSD um, junior and seniors. It was eight weeks, two time, two hours a week uh, on top of my job and finishing my master's program. But I will tell you that every day I did it, my heart was full of hope for the future because these young men and women are really gonna save the earth. Their sensibility is so amazing. And the more we can intern and work with our high school students and, and even the most recent young junior architects can do the same because the more we reach and bring those who are coming behind us forward, the better we will be as human beings. And to me, that's what I'm gonna do next year. I'll do this internship again, because um, my belief is that to, and this is mostly underserved students who were, who were in this program. And it was an opportunity that was done by the mayor's office. And these interns were paid by the mayor's office and my time was volunteer. So, each of these students now knows how to work in a work environment. They understand that you have to sign in on time, but they also understand that my love of design, we redesigned two, and I'll just make it really quick, right of ways underneath high power lines. So they learned about a lot of constraints. So it was an amazing experience. And I hope to maybe share to do a presentation with you all and share the work of our students because they went from barely really, you know, they were totally in love with SketchUp, but now they understand that SketchUp is a tool of design. So I, that's my hope. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you for exposing yourself to all of us and for showing everyone uh, paths to make change. And I hope that it inspired some people to be more involved in their municipalities, wherever, if they're in Los Angeles or wherever, Burbank, throughout the greater LA region, throughout the world, because um, having your perspectives can really make our world a better place.
I hope that you continue to contribute. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all so much. Great. So I think, uh, so thank you all for that lively and enlightening discussion. That was fantastic. Um, really inspiring. Um, I think it'll inspire a lot of conversations later in the afternoon. I'm Tony Lewis. I'm the Chief Financial Officer of AW Pussy, and I have the extreme pleasure of announcing that we will now be moving into a very short break. So go grab another coffee or matcha latte, and we will convene in about five minutes. Um, during the break, we're going to be showing this slideshow of our organization's history. This upcoming year is going to be our 100th year anniversary. And there is a diligent and dedicated committee of wonderful women working on events to mark the occasion. We hope you will all find ways to join us in the celebrations. Following our break will be the presentation of the AWAF Scholarship Awards. So see you here for that in about five minutes. Thanks a lot. See you soon. Welcome back, everyone. Um, we are now going to continue our day with uh, the AWAF, our sister foundation, uh, the awarding of their student scholarships. Great, thank you so much, Meg. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the AWAF Scholarship Awards. My name is Jana Wavy, and I'm a member of the Association for Women in Architecture Foundation Board and the co-chair for the awards committee. So AWAF, um, like Meg mentioned, likes to think of ourselves as the sister organization to AWA plus D with a shared mission. And as part of AWA, we have been offering scholarships for over 50 years, and we began offering a professional development fellowship five years ago. So the Association for Women in Architecture Foundation is a tax exempt 501c3 nonprofit organization. And we're dedicated to fostering educational and professional leadership opportunities for women in architecture and related fields. So I'd like to take a moment first to um, make some acknowledgements. So first of all, thank you to AWA plus D for putting together today's program and partnering with AWAF for our awards program. We're always really thrilled to be part of this annual symposium. Next, I'd like to thank my fellow AWAF board members. We have President Lise Bornstein, Vice President Christina Monti, Treasurer Michelle Wellchance, Secretary Tamara Gould, and members Ginger Tansman, Koji Sharaka, Joanne, Joanne Jackson, Mary Work, Monica Rodriguez, and Linda Daly. So the coordination and execution of the scholarship awards program takes a dedicated group of people. So thank you to also to the members of the awards committee for the effort that you've put in over the past year to carry out the scholarship program. So I'd like to mention um, our awards co-chair, Issa Mattia, and the members, John B. Kainani, Pema Wangzom, Clarissa Chung, and fondly, Lena Dows, who's retiring from the committee this year after decades of service to this organization. So thank you all. And a special thank you to our guest jurors for the scholarship awards. And now most importantly, perhaps we would not be doing any of this without the generosity of our many donors, the longtime loyal and new individuals, the long list of vendor sponsors that we have, and this year's scholarship sponsors, the Helms Bakery, Peggy Bowman, and KFA Architecture. So thank you, everybody. Um, last December, our holiday auction and fundraising event were, like everything else, held virtually. And our community of sponsors came through, and we had a really incredible and successful year. So thank you to all who made our auction successful and help us to continue our mission. But our work is never done, so please continue to support us. You can make a tax deductible donation anytime, or please consider us when planning your estate. We are very grateful for Peggy Bowman's bequest, which has funded scholarships for over seven years so far. Information on making our donations 
making donations is available on our website. So check out the chat, we just put that up there. And we're also looking to expand our connections with firms and local organizations. So if you'd like to connect with us, please send us an email. That email address for our president is in the chat as well. And stay tuned for more information. We haven't set a date yet for our annual holiday fundraiser. So we'll post information as soon as that's available. So this next part of the portion of the program will be facilitated by Issa Mattia. She's the co-chair of the AWAF Awards Committee and a project designer at IBI Group. We'll begin with the 2021 Scholarship Award announcements and have presentations by our student winners. And then we'll conclude with a moderated conversation with these recipients. So Issa, I'd like to pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jana. Thank you. All right, so reviewing the materials that our scholarship applicants submit each year has always been one of the highlights of working with the AWAF Awards Committee. Every year we're impressed and inspired by the creative thinking, the quality of crafts, and the ambition of the students. With the help of our generous donors, we're pleased to offer three scholarships to talented women who exemplify incredible design sensibilities and are highly engaged in their communities through organizations and through internships. So let's recognize our winners. Uh, after each winner is announced, they're going to present one of their projects from their portfolio. And after that, it will be followed by a conversation with the winners. So up first, uh, our first scholarship, the Helms Bakery Architecture and Design Scholarship is sponsored by Walter N. Marks Inc., the owner of the Helms Bakery District and a consistent supporter of AWA Plus D and AWAF programs and events. The Helms Bakery Architecture and Design Scholarship Award will go to Jen Kaur, who is an undergraduate student of design interior design at Cal State Long Beach. So Jen, can you uh, come on up <laughs> or wave so we can see you? Uh, Jen's inspiration is largely driven by inclusive and sustainable design. She believes design has the power for initiating change on these important topics in our society. The scholarship review committee found Jen to be thoughtful, inquisitive, and driven. She demonstrated strong design ideas and graphic skills in her portfolio, but also gave us a glimpse into her enthusiastic and optimistic personality. It's evident she's a natural leader with a clear vision of her goals and expectations for herself, and that's further conveyed through her hard work ethic and her determination to succeed. During the transition to um, virtual schooling uh, last year due to COVID, she moved back home to, or to her family home in Malaysia while continuing to pursue her degree in interior design. So despite a significant time difference that kept her in classes at odd hours, Jen not only continued in the program, but excelled beyond her professor's expectations. Her eagerness to grow and to learn is going to be a huge asset that's going to follow her throughout her design career. So I want to say congratulations again to Jen. If we can. <laughs> um, and <laughs> Uh, today, Jen is going to be presenting on the next office interior design project, uh, her winning submission to a national student design competition. So Jen, can you share your screen? Great. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, you're good whenever you're ready. Awesome. Thank you, Isa, for the introduction. And I really think that this recognition is meaningful to me especially coming from an organization that empowers women in design. Um, so I'm very excited to share my favorite project that I recently submitted to the Studcase Next Student Design Competition. Um, a little introduction about this project. This is a design for a two-story satellite office for Next, which is a global technology company in Atlanta, Georgia, specializing in health and wellness. So my design is strongly inspired by the Atlanta spirit of resilience from overcoming the challenges um, since the Civil War to its prosperity today. This hybrid office design wants to um, foster resilience to workplace challenges such as COVID um, at next while honoring the local character at Atlanta. So this sectional diagram shows the transformation of the geometry from the second level, which is the main entry level, 
which brings a sense of expand and contraction feeling to encourage creativity and innovation on the second level, whereas the first level consists of a more still and rigid form to promote focused work. The main entry of the next office is on the second level, and here's the view of the reception. And I, I, want to, I want the reception to establish a unique first impression of the next office. So the logo designed with the integrated LED lighting um, reveals a strong personality of um, Next that brings people the excitement to start a new day. Adjacent to the reception, we are looking at the inspiration zone for product experience. I want to create a space where the guest has the freedom to rediscover themselves through senses. So the inspiration zone introduced a variety of experiential options, such as um, visual, tactile, and auditory offerings to feature the versatility of next products. I always believe that um, creative ideas often arise from casual conversation. So here is the next cafe. We are looking at um, a view that is facing um, towards the street and it offers diverse seating options to fulfill individual preferences. Um, also considering this multifunctional space might hold casual meetings, there is technology integration um, to the furniture design and acoustic solution on the ceiling to help reduce noise. This is a dedicated space for face-to-face -face and virtual conferences with strategic camera placement angle, um, as well as audio system. And also in order to encourage meaningful discussion in this conference um, room, I also incorporated a writable and magnetic wall for people to express their ideas. With these design solutions, I think distance is no longer a barrier for virtual collaboration for the future of future office design. So next is a company that emphasizes personal and professional development. And here is a multifunctional forum space for lectures and workshop. This is a space where learning and doing intertwine. Well, during the lecture session, the space can adapt to various configurations with the help of um, foldable furniture design, which reflect the concept of resilience and flexibility. Moving further, the monumental stairs will lead you to the first level. As you proceed to the first level, the architectural forms of the stairs are becoming more and more softened as you proceed. It gives the user a transitional feeling from energetic to calm. Here's the first level. The first level is designed for a focused working environment. And I incorporated an engraved historical map at the back wall, it shows the transformation of Atlanta over the years, and it is an important connection between the user and the resilient character of Atlanta. I also think that um, when challenges arise during work, the Atlanta spirit reminds the employee not to give up, but overcome it. While the monumental staircase can also serve as a venue for a company-wide conference. Adjacent to the open office, I want to provide a casual area for discussion. I call this area the living room because I think it's very casual and it is a space where written words and body language unleash your creativity. I wanted to implement a biophilic concept through a um, biomorphic wall pattern to help reduce stress, enhance creativity and clarity of thoughts. During the design process, I studied the branding and wayfinding element to ensure a good user experience. So every location of the signage is determined by the sideline study of the user. In short, these three elements help ensure the accuracy and completeness of my design intent of resilience. They are the balance between work and well-being, the flexibility of spaces, as well as the expansion and contraction geometry. With these integral design solution, I think next employee will not only be agile and adaptive to the physical and virtual working environment, but also increase the overall engagement of its workforce. So I hope you enjoy the journey at the next office. Thank you.
Thank you, Jen. You're welcome. All right. <laughs> And we'll come back to you soon. Uh, up next, we have the Peggy Bowman uh, Award. Uh, Peggy Bowman left a bequest to the AWAF that has provided the core to our scholarship fund. An early female architectural pioneer, Peggy's work is archived at the Virginia Tech University in their Virginia Heritage Manuscript and Archival Collections. This year, the Peggy Bowman Scholarship Award goes to Lauren Ashley Week, earning her dual degrees at University of Michigan, a Master of Urban and Regional Planning, and a Juris Doctor. So Lauren, can you wave so we can find you? <laughs> uh, Lauren's ability to explore and solve real world problems by bringing people together, uh, or bringing together urban planning and law is highly impressive. Her passion for supporting small businesses was evident in the research she presented and we'll share with you all today. Through the thoughtful research she collected and presented to the city, she influenced policy that had direct impact to improve her local community in a way that others had not considered before. She sees opportunity rather than conflict when collaborating with various stakeholders with largely varying interests. Her positive outlook towards working with others and throughout the process is fantastic and will serve her well and what looks to be a very promising future. So congratulations to Lauren. And if you can share your screen uh, for, your or for Lauren's presentation, she's going to speak about shaking up small businesses and sharing her research regarding the seismic retrofit upgrade requirements in San Francisco and the hardships that it caused to the small businesses that are affected. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to uh, win the award and I'm really honored to present to you all today. Um, so this is my research project I conducted in collaboration with the Office of Small Business through the city and county of San Francisco. Um, I'm from Northern California. I think most folks in attendance are in Southern California, so representing the northern part of the state today. Um, my research is called Shaking Up Small Business, the Impact of Seismic Retrofitting on Small Businesses in Three San Francisco Supervisor Districts. So to provide a little bit of background, uh, in 2013, the city of San Francisco passed a local ordinance, Ordinance 6613, which was in response to the threat of a high magnitude earthquake. Um, it is predicted that there's a 72% risk of a 6.7 or above magnitude earthquake within the next 30 years. And obviously earthquakes can cause a lot of devastation, but this is a particular problem for the city of San Francisco because so much of their housing stock and commercial uh, buildings are soft story buildings. Um, and you can see an example of that um, on the picture on the screen right now of the devastation that can be caused when soft story buildings are put through a large scale high magnitude earthquake. And so that's why they passed Ordinance 6613, which created this mandatory seismic retrofit program all property owners owning soft story buildings across the city were required to do these mandatory seismic retrofits. Um, this affected residential mixed juice um, buildings and my study fo uh, focused on mixed juice buildings. Um, so overall, this impacted over 5,000 buildings, but as I mentioned, these were uh, different types of buildings. So they broke the city broke them into four tiers. As I only focused on mixed use building, that was considered tier four buildings, which is 1,009 structures total. And they had an original deadline for property owners to finish the mandatory seismic retrofits by September 15th, 2020. So the reason that this was a problem, of course, we need these sorts of laws. We need to make the city of San Francisco resilient to earthquake risk and other environmental hazards. But in combination with another law, which is passed the San Francisco Rent Board Guidelines, all of the property owners that were required to do these mandatory seismic retrofits were legally allowed to pass through the improvement cost on to their tenants. Um, the city of San Francisco foresaw this as being an issue for the low income populations of the city, so they created an appeals process. Unfortunately, that appeals process was only applicable to residential tenants. So if resident residential tenants couldn't afford the increased rents that were passed through by this legal pass through mechanism, um, they could appeal and the city would cover the difference between their current rent and the increased rent passed through through the legal pass through. However, for commercial tenants, which is in those tier four buildings, those commercial ground floor uses, they had no appeals process available to them and they were still getting that legal pass through of uh, increased rents due to the rent board guidelines. So my research question based off the confluence of these two laws was does the mandatory seismic retrofit program disproportionately impact small business owners in lower income neighborhoods um, and that is the research I will be presenting today. 
So how I did this is I created a sample frame of three supervisor districts. Um, in total, the city has 11 supervisor districts. I chose these three because they represented different swaths of San, Francisco, San Francisco's population. District one, the Richmond, which is what it's more commonly known as, is about a half white and half Asian community, but it has a high proportion of foreign born uh, populations. Most of these are coming from Russia and Eastern Europe, as well as Chinese immigrants. And the median household income is pretty average for the city of San Francisco overall. District two, the Marina, is the highest income district in San Francisco, and it's also a 78% white community. Uh, it has a lower foreign born population than the average district in San Francisco. And as you can see, that very high medium household income at 128,000. Uh, above, above that number. And then District 5 was kind of a mixed community. They have different racial representations, white, Asian, and also District 5 reaches into the historically African American community of the Fillmore District. So it also has a larger Black population than other districts within San Francisco. It has a pretty average foreign born population and then a little bit higher than average household income. Um, so this map shows those three districts I just introduced with the tier four properties mapped across them. Um, and so the reason I did this is that this identified what I called impacted, uh, not only the impact commercial spaces, but helped me identify which census tracts I wanted to look at within those districts. So I removed all residential census tracts and only used the commercial census tracts as identified by these impacted commercial spaces in my sample frame. And then I use a combination of research tools to kind of figure out if these small businesses were impacted by the program. So the first thing I looked at was just Google Maps. I did a more qualitative study, seeing how Google Maps timeline feature, how those uh, those buildings and those businesses change pre the mandatory seismic retrofit program and post the mandatory seismic retrofit program. I also used San Francisco's GIS and property information map to look at different records on the building permit, um, et cetera. I use data SF, which collects all business registration data. You can see when a business started and when it closed through this information. And then when I couldn't figure out, because sometimes government databases are a little clunky or not always updated, I tried to supplement uh, when I couldn't figure out if a business was open or closed um, through using things such as Google Timelines, as I Google Maps Timeline, as I mentioned, Yelp, because uh, using the power of community reporting to see when businesses were reported as closed, and then also commercial leasing sites to see if certain addresses were available for rent for commercial commercial tenants. And through that, I uh, collated these results. So you can see uh, the number of impacted commercial spaces across districts one, two, and five, how many turned over. When I say turned over, that's defined as businesses that are not vacant. They have a new business, but the original business pre the mandatory seismic retrofit program is no longer open in that location. And then businesses that are completely vacant. So no business had moved in after the retrofit had uh, retrofitting had been conducted. And then through that, I um, measured these together, just a simple sum and created an impact measurement. And as you can see, these impact measurements are very, very high, 72%, 76%, and 66% um, across the three supervisor districts. And so using those impact measurements, I used GIS um, to map this into those commercial census tracts across the three supervisor districts. So the more red a district is through GIS, you can see that it's more extremely impacted by the retrofit program in terms of turnover and vacancy. And then the lighter the color, that means it's less impacted. And then I contrasted this also using a geospatial analysis, um, measuring this against the median household income to represent uh, more lower income populations on those com same commercial census tracts. Uh, the lighter blue means it's a wealthier community and the darker blue means it's a lower income community. And then contrasting these two maps together, I tried to see if there was any sort of geospatial uh, relationship. But as you can see, there isn't a clear pattern between the most impacted census, commercial census tracts across these districts and the more high, higher or lower income communities. So I, I found that Luckily, in terms of the equity analysis, there wasn't a more disproportionate impact on lower income communities. However, I think it's important to acknowledge that there is this tension between environmental resiliency and economic resiliency for these communities, just because there wasn't a disproportionate impact. Most of these small businesses were incredibly impacted as evidenced by my impact measurements um, above 60% for all three supervisor districts. And you can kind of see this through this qualitative data. This is a picture of one of the uh, tier four properties pre the seismic retrofitting. You'll see the businesses on the, the bottom floor. There's a smoke shop on the very far corner. There's a Vietnamese um, sub uh, sandwich shop, um, et cetera. And then if you look at the next picture, all of those businesses except for one have now been replaced. Most property owners, as you look at the qualitative data that I dug through, 
um, you'll see that because they had to do the mandatory seismic retrofit, they also took this as an opportunity to upgrade their buildings aesthetically, um, which led to a lot of echo gentrification in these communities. So now instead of a smoke shop, you see there's like a vegan boba shop on the far corner here, um, which I classified as like an Instagrammable kind of location where people come from across the city to take cute Instagram pictures. There's now a sit down sushi restaurant and the only remaining business is this bus stop pizza. Um, you can see the, how bus stop pizza did remain, but they've done a quite, a, a quite a bit of their own upgrade. And when I lived in this neighborhood, um, pre seismic retrofit program, this bus stop pizza, you could get a slice of pizza for a dollar or $2, but now that same slice of pizza, same owners is about $4. Um, so you can see how that this program is creating echo gentrification and still affecting communities, even if there isn't a disproportionate impact. Um, so what has come from this research, I uh, again collaborated with the Office of Small Business through the local government and based on my results, they shared that with the city's Board of Supervisors and the Board of Supervisors actually passed legislation um, early, late last, last year that would um, gave uh, property owners more time to do the seismic upgrades. And the reason this is important is because now the Board of Supervisors is more conscious about the potential impacts on small businesses and trying to come up with solutions to make sure that these sorts of impacts, especially now that we have COVID-19 and the drastic, terrible impact that COVID-19 has had on small businesses, it's really important that legislation considers these equity implications and the impact on the small business community um, from the forefront and not afterwards. So that's why this legislation was passed to extend the deadline. Um, and I will actually be working for the city and county of San Francisco as an intern this summer. So I'm looking forward to continuing with this project and other projects to help the small business community in a city that I love. Um, but thank you so much. That's my presentation. All right, that was great. Thank you, Lauren. Um, up next, uh, with an architectural staff that is over 50% women, KFA Architecture is proud to support women in the workplace and has sponsored an AWAF scholarship annually since 2014. KFA is also a signer of the 5050 by 2020 AWA plus D initiative and the SoCal NOMA 2020 Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Challenge. In 2020, the AWAF Equity Committee developed an equity statement and action plan, and this outlined action items for the organization to, practi to practice greater empathy and examine ways that we can pursue intentional and sustainable change. From this plan, the Social Impact Scholarship Award was born. The purpose of this award is to publicly recognize and provide financial award to a student woman for her demonstration of community oriented goals and exceptional contributions to address inequities in local communities. We're excited to announce the first winner of the annual social impact award to Ashley Morales, an undergraduate architecture student at Cal Poly Pomona. Can you please wave so we can see you. Ashley is an architecture student with a minor in gender and sexuality studies. She works closely with her university to promote and ensure the school is safe, welcoming, and inclusive for her fellow students and those who will follow her long after she's graduated. Her drive comes from her passion to bridge the gap between architecture and humanities through research and design with the overarching goal of social justice. The review committee was inspired by Ashley's vigorous work to question the norm, fight for equity, and her drive to create a just world, which is crucial to the, the current social climate we face today. She identified missing pieces in her curriculum and worked with the, with the staff to develop the program to address inequities she had, she had discovered. Her passion for addressing these challenges head on, even when she may have felt alone in the battle, is admirable and greatly needed in this industry. She challenges not only gender inequalities, but those of race and culture. Ashley is clearly passionate about the injustices of the world and in the design field specifically, and she's doing the work to address the problems we face. So congratulations again, Ashley. Thank you so much. I'm going to try not to get emotional, but thank you, thank you. And so, so yeah, just quickly, so today Ashley is going to be presenting on a handbook that she compiled, and this is titled Reindigenization, the, Land the Landers Writing Retreat Center. 
This handbook was created to recognize indigenous communities and the representation of their culture and history at a project site. So take it away. Thank you so much for that, Isa. Um, hi, everyone. Like my fellow winners, I'm so honored to be here presenting to you today. So um, the work I'd like to present to you is a handbook I created for my topic studio last semester focused on representation. Our final project was to design a writer's retreat center in Landers by Joshua Tree, California. I had an honest conversation with my instructor, Wendy Gilmartin, about how I was uncomfortable with designing such a structure because what everyone saw as a blank canvas in the desert, I saw rich in culture and history of the indigenous people that were displaced from there. Last semester, I felt all of my classes coming together as I was taking courses for my gender and sexuality studies minor that focused on intersectionality, art as social justice, and the work of Black women in social movements. So this handbook is a culmination of all of that work coming together and me adapting the prompts so I can explore these topics in a different medium. So the three main themes in the handbook are re-indigenization, decolonization, and reparations. It started in my researching the indigenous tribes and their counter narratives to the westernized history of their communities, as well as discovering the work indigenous women were doing to rematriate the land and return it to its original caretakers. The handbook is both a handbook and an archive in the perspective of an architecture firm taking a community-based approach to the design of such a large structure. So we as the firm go through the planning process, um, meetings with the tribes, leaders, and the community, defining roles, engaging with the community as allies, um, artistic activities, and the start of the design process. So the end goals are to ensure that some benefits of the final product or operations go back to the tribes, whether it's work in the construction process, in decorating the space or working at the center. And towards the end is a call to action um, to all architects to understand that, that decolonization helps drive new principles of design and just a general way of thinking to help us better advocate for underserved communities and be more active in our allyship. Hey, Ashley, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it looks like you're yes. sharing just the cover page. Oh, really? I was looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <I see. laughs> You can't see me cl clicking through anything? Unless that's just my end, but I'm just seeing the uh, the cover. Yeah, just, just the cover. Try to stop sharing and start sharing again. Do you, what do y'all see now? Uh, we're waiting for it to, it says you're sharing, but it's not sharing anything yet. Okay, my Zoom is. <laughs> Would you like me? I can share. I have it up on my screen as well. If you want me to flip through. Oh, oh yeah, that would be great. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> my Zoom is active. Isa, why don't you go ahead and pull it up? Yeah, so sorry about that. I don't know why I was crashing on you. Let's try this. Hey, you know, the supervisor had, had issues too. <laughs> All right. Oh, no, I did the wrong. Let's do presentation. So how's everyone's day going? <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Okay. Here okay. We go. 
I apologize. So I did go through it, but um, if you can like just click through the ECI, wonderful, thank you. Um, so yeah, like I said, the handbook is like an archive and a, a handbook on like how to go through the process of approaching tribes, of reaching out to the community through different means, um, understanding that there's like language barriers and access barriers, um, providing different spaces for the communities to give their honest opinion about what a project would look like on this site, um, especially even if they don't occupy it currently, um, what it means for them um, as a community. Um, and then again, providing like creating a vision and a mission statement together on what the final product would look like. Um, so this is, yeah, so just defining roles um, and then again, talking about um, allyship and advocacy, um, not just treating the community just like test subjects, you know, asking them questions and walking away, um, but engaging with them as well um, and advocating on their behalf in, in whatever issues that they need, whether it's in, in a protest, whether it's, um, you know, with the government accessing like different resources, um, just being there and being equals throughout the process. Yeah, and then the next few pages are just examples of what um, activities we could do together to learn from each other. So as I was learning about art and social justice, um, kind of practicing through different mediums um, on how to communicate with each other and learn you know, our different values. And then this would just be the, the call to action to all architects about um, what a process like um, decolonization could mean um, for the practice um, and for communities that often feel um, voiceless in, 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 in the environmental design field in the community. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you, Ashley. Okay, so I wanna congratulate everyone again for congratulations to all of our winners. Uh, so uh, our next portion of the, of the scholarship award section of today uh, was to jump into a few questions for our winners so we can learn a little bit more about each of you and the accomplishments uh, that led to this award. So I wanna invite everybody that if you have any questions for our winners based on their presentations or otherwise, uh, to feel free to add those to the chat. And if we have some extra time, we'll go through those. Uh, so my first question for, uh, this is to all three winners uh, is, uh, what is your main goal or aspiration that you want to achieve in the design field? And let's start with Jen. Hello, everyone. Um, for my interior design career, I hope that I can utilize my professional knowledge to help improve some societal challenges in my career, um, especially when it comes to inclusivity and environmental related issues. Like how Isa mentioned that I think that design has the power for initiating change. So I think interior design can be one of the solution for, um, for improving this societal challenges. Um, for my personal goal in five years, I hope that I can um, complete my education, obviously, um, as well as be becoming a well-rounded designer, having the credential of NCIDQ, CID, and LEAD because I want to make myself be more educated on the topics that I care and also educate other designers as well as my client in the future. Um, in 10 years, I hope that I am not only designing beautiful spaces, but also become a leader or an advocate who is daring to start important conversations about um, issues happening in our society, um, such as some ongoing issues like racism or gender inequality, housing crisis and pandemic and more. Yeah, that's my goal. No, no big deal. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> no, that's amazing. And uh, so then same question for uh, Lauren, what's your main goal and aspiration? Uh, in design? So I, yeah, so I went into my dual program with the ultimate goal of becoming a land use attorney, specifically, ideally, um, I'd like to see myself working at a city attorney's office for San Francisco or another big city in the state of California, because California is my home and the communities I care about. Um, but in terms of how that integrates with design, um, I see a lot when I do informational interviews with land use attorneys in the field right now, um, most of them do not have a, a dual degree in urban planning or a design background. And I think that's really problematic because they're creating laws that impact our built environments and the way that our land is used. Um, and they don't maybe know the, all the background and the information they need to make sure that those laws are environmentally sustainable, but also um, just and pursue things like racial justice and equality. Um, and another thing I see a lot is most people in this field tend to be men, and they also tend to have a big focus on environmental resiliency, which I think is absolutely important. But as you can see through my research, I think you also need to consider the economic impacts of some of these environmental resiliency efforts because environmental um, environmentalism for a very long time has not been inclusive and has not uh, considered and been intersectional in terms of inter, uh, racial justice as well and also economic, socioeconomic justice. So I kind of want to bring all those things together with my background in urban planning and my background in law to make the land use field, especially in terms of law, um, more sustainable but also more just um, and more inclusive. Great. And now Ashley? Yeah, so if I were to be honest, I have a lot of many goals, but if I were to kind of like narrow it down, I would say, you know, overarching, the overarching thing is always social justice. And I'm very, even now, just as a fourth year, I'm very accustomed to introducing like uncomfortable, um, reflective conversations about social justice and how, you know, as architectural students and then hopefully in the field, how we, um, not just perform that, but advocate for people and be allies um, throughout that process. And maybe, and, you know, it's not an, an easy conversation to have with people to say, maybe you're not doing it right because this process is very slow. We have not at all re reached, you know, equity in terms of gender representation, racial representation, let alone providing communities with what they need. So I, I look forward to just continuing to have those conversations and, making it a, a natural part of the process um, to integrate, uh, you know, these community-based approaches um, and that, that thoughtfulness um, for those that are underrepresented and underserved. That's great. And I know you're already starting to do this work at school. Um, you're currently a TA for a history of architecture course. And uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the problems that you recognized in that curriculum and how you approach those concerns? Yeah, so this is my third semester of being a teacher's assistant to my architecture his uh, history instructor. Um, when I was a student in her class, that's when I really um, kind of opened my eyes to how um, how very narrow the, the curriculum and my other courses were, especially in our introductions to architecture. It was kind of a rude awakening. I think I, I was very hyper aware since my first year that it was clear that like one, uh, like one specific type of person was a star architect, wasn't a lone genius in the field. And if you looked like that, there was a higher probability that you would make a difference um, in our profession. And so when I was a student in that class, um, it really opened my eyes that there's so much more information that weren't, is not made available to us. And now that as, as a teacher's assistant and in my other courses, it's just tough to kind of realize that maybe some instructors or maybe the format of some classes doesn't find that information relevant, doesn't find representation in different reading um, and different case studies relevant. And so again, it's like having this uncomfortable like, confrontation with yourself that, you know, how can I, you know, take control of my education and, you know, find out about people and things that I really care about that I think are important to being an architect. Um, and thankfully, I'm, I'm also now on the committee for my college. Um, uh, we have a my college introduced a diversity assessment and plan of action, and I'm on the committee for curriculum throughout the college. 
Um, and actually our first goal is one that I introduced, which was asking instructors to take the summer to look over their case studies list and their readings list and really think about what voices they're amplifying um, through those courses and what they're uh, you know, introducing to students um, because they like to say that we're a diverse student body, but it doesn't, you know, they're not giving us that, that hope and that inspiration in our courses. So it, it's a long process, but uh, thankfully we're starting that you know, this year. Yeah, no, that's excellent. And we're excited to see these changes happening, you know, starting at the school level and hopefully that that just helps integrate into the design and professional field as you, mm -hmm. you know, once you graduate to and you'll bring that impact. Uh, so next, I have a question for Lauren. Uh, you embody this effort of collaboration in many different ways, <laughs> uh, like obviously like foremost with law and with urban planning, but just um, you had, when, when we spoke earlier, you talked about a project that you had worked on uh, with many different interests involved. So can you tell us a little bit about that project and what contributed to your success? Sure. So in my um, in my dual degree, it's a four year program. My first year was full time urban planning. And this past year has been full time law school. And my next two years will be a mix of both. But in my first year, when I was doing urban planning full time, we had a mini capstone project where we were trying to create an aerotropolis between the Detroit Metropolitan Airport. I go to University of Michigan, so hence the Michigan focus. Um, and then another smaller local municipal airport called Willow Tree. Um, and creating this, the uh, original plan that the local community, which was a small township, had implemented was just a small logistics and transportation center. But they had this idea that they really wanted to envision it as a community space or use or tap into some of its natural assets um, to create some sort of like park environment and in combination with the logistics and transportation center. And so on that project, I worked with a multidisciplinary plenary team of civil engineers, um, more architect design focused planning students, and then more public policy housing advocates, um, folks that are planners, but are coming at it from more of a humanities lens or angle. And then I was bringing more of a legal perspective and looking into the different um, like government financing tools that we could use to create a project like this. And because we had all these different perspectives and also in our meetings with the town and the, the city, the local city government, um, trying to bring all these different interests together to create the best plan. What we settled on is we compromised by creating three different plans for the community so that they could select with, with what best would serve them. So the first one was pretty standard to what they had already had where we were mostly focusing on the economic aspects of the plan. So that logistics and transportation center and not really touching a lot of the rest of the parcel. Then we had a medium density development where we used um, the different perspectives and we created more of a natural assets where um, we still had that logistics and transportation center, but a large majority we had um, amplified the existing natural assets to create a part of the metro park system that already runs through the southeast Michigan region and then we had a high density development which I actually collaborated one of my teammates is a student a design student from China and I had spent a year living in Asia so I had spent a lot of time going to Asian airports and seeing how the the uh, connection that were like the type of environment or the, uh, that airports in Asia have is very different than when you think of going to the airport in the US. When you go to the airport in the US, it's kind of a drag. You don't really want to go. But I was living in India um, and I had spent a lot of time at the Bangalore airport. And if you've ever been there, it is a community resource. People, even if they don't have a flight, they will drive in traffic like an hour, two hours just to go hang out at the airport. And then I had also spent a lot of time in the Singapore airport, which is also a similar experience. And I was like, why can't we have that sort of thing in the US? So collaborating with the design student from China, we created a high density development where we had, you know, a food pop up shop, a different like a community art fair space, and then also creating some of those natural elements and still having the economic transportation and logistics center. And then we presented all three of those options to our government and community partners. Wow. Yeah, no, that's excellent. Thank you for sharing. Um, we are running short on time, but I have one more question for Jen. Um, so last year you moved back to Malaysia to be with your family when the pandemic hit. So can you tell us a little bit about how you've accomplished so much during this time? I also saw a question pop up about talking about your answer earlier and if, how are you, are you planning to stay there? What, how does that work into your goals? And then just for reference, what time is it there now <laughs> so that we understand <laughs> your time difference? 
it's 3 a.m. in the morning now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, thank you so much for being here. No problem, it's an honor. Um, the, the pandemic really brings a lot of um, challenges to my life in terms of financial struggles and um, adapting to online classes in a completely opposite time zone. But I think my passion and determination in design really keep me going and I am clear and determined to achieve my goals. So I won't say that a pandemic will put a stop on my personal and professional development. So um, throughout the past year, I, will, I took initiative to engage in the industry through talks, events, competition, and scholarships, and more. I think those kind of events and exposure contribute to um, what I achieved today, as well as um, learning how to be resilient during this tough time. Um, I had multiple virtual collaboration with my classmates, um, as well as communicated with multiple companies in the United States. I think that really challenged me to become more resilient and um, figuring out new ways in design. And I think that really um, pushed me out of my comfort zone as a designer. And that, can, that quality can really play into my future working environment. Um, so regarding the question about um, what's my future plan, I plan to be um, going back to the United States in 2022, which is next year. And I would say I'm lucky enough um, to get a lot of opportunity and my first virtual internship in Malaysia with in um, San Francisco company. So that will be a very excited journey. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, so how are we doing on time? Do we have five minutes, 10 minutes? We can do one more question. One more. OK. I saw that there were a few questions in the chat. Um, I guess, Ashley, uh, following up on what you were talking about earlier, it, can you tell us if there's any accountability that's set up for the, in the, for the instructors you're encouraging to revisit um, for their case study list? Um, so yeah, like I said, uh, Right now we're formalizing it as like a decree from the College of ENV. Um, again, like trying to very formalize it um, and make it not so much a demand, but also kind of a demand for our instructors to kind of take the summer um, to look over their case studies and their rating lists. So hopefully is not such a difficult task, um, but we do plan on having some sort of, um, you know, glance over as, the fall semester starts. So unfortunately, we haven't been able to have too many meetings about it. Um, but over the summer, we do plan to have that, you know, go out to all the instructors. That's great. Um, did we have any other questions in the chat? I think there was there was one that we could um, get some quick responses from our recipients because um, it was noticed that you all have a strong focus and passion on social justice and equity. And um, the question is, do you find that you are unique within your classmates or is that kind of a, a general trend with your generation of, of students? I wrote a um, quick chat, but I can um, expand on my answer that I had in the chat. Um, so the the process that Ashley is describing that she's leading at her school, which I think is phenomenal, that process happened at University of Michigan's Urban Planning and Architecture School about five years ago. It's in its fifth year of curriculum review, um, creating more equity focus. And I think because I came towards the end of that of that um, reshaping of the curriculum, I see social equity at the forefront of everything I do at the planning school. All of my classes are very equity focused. We read um, perspectives from diverse, you know, scholars. It's not just white men on my syllabus anymore. There's, you know, um, there's scholarship from women of color. There's scholarship from outside of the Western hemisphere um, and not just the global north. And so I think that I wouldn't say I'm unique in that program because, and it is one of the reasons why I chose University of Michigan and that school in particular is because I saw equity so emphasized when I was uh, looking at different graduate programs. However, um, coming from the, the law school side, just finishing my first year of law school, I do not 
see that same equity lens. Um, your first year of law school, you don't have a decision in choosing your classes. Um, you only get one elective and you take um, the standard 1L coursework. And in those classes, equity was often an afterthought or not really considered at all of how these different laws or these different precedents might be affecting communities um, differently. And I think the only exception to that was I did take international environmental law as my elective. So you saw a lot more of that focus. Um, and the students that gravitated towards that is part of this small public interest community at the law school that do have that equity perspective and social justice lens. Um, and then they just hired, um, because the law school has been getting some slack for that. They did just hire new faculty and I was very fortunate to take um, one of my core courses with a new faculty member um, who implemented a lot of social social justice and gender and intersect intersectional perspectives into our torts coursework. Tort law is just like the law of injury. So normally it's very dry. We don't really talk about how you might not think there might be any equity implications in tort law, but there actually is quite a bit of equity implications, especially in how um, plaintiffs are paid out when they do get injured. Um, there's been a long history of those payments being traced to what your gender is and what your race and how they think that will affect your income over time. And so those are very, very terrible equity implications for those injured part uh, plaintiffs. Um, and she actually was one of my first professors to kind of acknowledge that in the coursework. So I think the law school has a lot more work to do. All right. This has been really great to hear um, from all three of you from diverse programs and places. And again, congratulations to everyone. I think it would be great if everyone could unmute and like applause for real <laughs> <laughs> instead of like the, the silent Yay. clapping. <laughs> so, um, incredible work by all of you. So, so thank you again. And um, I would like to mention um, before we wrap up this, this part of today's event that next Friday, AWAF will be announcing our fellowship award for 2021. And we'll also get to hear about the great work that our 2020 recipient, Ashley Margo has been doing. She'll give a presentation called Los Angeles by Color. So I hope you all can join us again at around the same time next week. So thank you everyone. Thank you all, and uh, congratulations again to all the AWAF scholarship recipients. We, um, we wish you all the best, and we definitely look forward to your, future com to your future contributions, which we are confident that you all will make. Um, I, I think you all have been informed of this, but as part of your uh, award, you also receive a free membership to AWA plus D. So we're excited to have you all as new members and hope to see you at future events. Um, what we'd like to do now is break out into breakout rooms uh, to give everybody an opportunity to connect, network, and have more intimate conversations. So we'll have five rooms and each will be led by an AWA plus D member or one of today's presenters. And you'll be assigned to a room randomly We'll be in these breakout rooms for about 20 minutes, and then we'll all come back to the main room and wrap up, wrap up the day. Yeah, we got cut off um, right in the middle of something really cool. That Maybe it will go so fast. Ugh. Yes, that's great. I think, is, is everyone back, Sarah? Okay. All right, well, uh, I think this is it for us today. I wanted to thank everyone for joining. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you uh, to our speakers and presenters. I think I speak for everyone for, um, uh, and I confirmed this from our um, breakout group that we are all left with uh, a lot of inspiration and energy. And um, I think if uh, maybe everyone can one more time uh, unmute themselves to um, um, give our speakers a round of applause. You start by me. Yay. Um, and I just wanted to um, uh, have, uh, say a few announcements. Uh, please join us next week for um, 
Another day, another great day planned uh, on the topic of politics and design. We are looking at it from a slightly different angle next time. Um, and then lastly, um, please, if you are not a member, please consider to be becoming a member. Um, if you are a professional, it's only $95 to be a part of the supporting community and great programming. Um, and uh, and that's, uh, with that, that's all. I hope to see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a great day.